What's going on in this short-term rental market and does it still make sense? And if it does, how do you choose the right market and the right property in that market? I'm Kathy Fedke and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today, Avery Carl, is the author of Amazon's bestseller, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth and the host of the Short Term Show podcast. She's also the CEO of the Short Term Shop. Avery went from a $37,000 salary to a real estate portfolio of over 220 doors in just five years. So I think she knows a few things about this asset class. Avery, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thank you so much for having me. We haven't really spent a lot of time on this show talking about short-term rentals as a specific investment strategy. So I'm really curious, first of all, to hear how things are going for short-term rental owners. Have, has it changed much and how much has it changed over the last few years? Yeah, so it's changed a lot. Uh, I remember you know, we've been investing in short-term rentals for 10 years now. So we started in 2015. And back then, like nobody believed us that this was an, an actual asset class and you could actually make money doing this. They kind of looked at it as, oh, like Airbnb, isn't that for college kids renting each other's futons to each other? That's stupid. <laughs> That's not real estate investing. But, um, you know, we really focus on vacation rentals in vacation markets and not just, you know, trying to rent out um, a, a futon <laughs> or, you know, a room in our house. Uh, so it has changed a lot. Uh, people kind of started realizing around 2019, right before COVID, oh, hey, this is an actual asset class. It's been around for centuries, actually, been around for decades in the form of vacation rentals in vacation markets, but only in the past 10 years with the inception of Airbnb. And then really, Verbo has been around since 97, I think. So for a really long time, but it just kind of caught on that you could manage these yourself without that middleman 40% manager. That, that's what yeah. it used to cost was 40%. And um, so only then did it kind of take off. And we had a big explosion, as did all asset classes in 2021 and 2022, with interest rates being super low and everybody buying real estate. A lot of people got in that really weren't looking at it as the business that it is. Same thing with anything. And uh, so a lot of those people are getting out now when they realize, oh, you know, dealing with people isn't always a lot of fun. And this is actually work. It's not just, you know, I can't throw my phone in the ocean and lay on the beach the rest of my life. I can lay on the beach and answer a few messages and manage my short-term rentals, but like you do have to do work. And um, also, you know, that what's the statistic? 50% of all real estate investments are sold within the first two years whether it's short-term, long-term, et cetera. So, um, you know, we, we're seeing a good, I think a really good stabilization in the short-term rental asset class. Uh, travel is a little bit down right now because I, whether they want to call it a recession or not, like it is, I'm not an economist, but it is. You know, people are spending <laughs> less money. So uh, we've seen a little bit of a dip in income, but nothing too severe in, you know, if you're buying in the right market. So it's still my favorite asset class to invest in, and, and we invest in all types of real estate. It really is just, it's the most fun. Yeah. If you get it right, it is extremely lucrative. And I'm sure people who bought, this is the problem. People bought at the peak when the numbers were the best. And, you know, it was after COVID, there weren't any hotels open really. So, right. and people felt safer just renting a house. So the numbers were really great. And people were buying those assets based on the idea that that would continue without understanding that, hey, once hotels are back up and running, there's going to be some competition. And when borders open, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when people can go, you know, to Mexico, like we just got back from, <laughs> or, uh, you know, Europe or wherever, then maybe you're not going to see as, as uh, much, as robust a market as it was before. But I, I, going back to what you said earlier, which was, this is not a new asset class. That is so true. I mean, when we first moved to Malibu, it was really a thing. People, and it still is, where people would leave for the summer, rent out their house through an agent, like you were saying, it's through vac vacation property managers. They would take 50%, not 40, 50% mm -hmm. 
uh, to manage that asset, but it was still enough money that people in Malibu would come back and they would have all their expenses pretty much paid for the rest of the year. So it wasn't generally a property that's only vacation rental. It's sort of like, hey, this will get us through, um, you know, this will help pay for costs to be able to live in such an expensive place. Um, same with any any ski area, any beach area, none of this is new. What's new is the ease of it, right? And so I would think a lot of the vacation managers and Verbo was really irritated because now they're on the radar more than they used to be, right? I mean, is there kind of a fight there? I mean, is are other companies that have been doing this a long time just frustrated with how this became more main, mainstream through Airbnb? Definitely the old school property management companies have, have gotten or a little irritated because when I first started, when I first started selling vacation rental real estate as a real estate agent, I started doing a lot of volume. I became very successful as a real estate agent very quickly. And the property manager started to notice that. And so since most of the properties that I was selling in the Smokies were already vacation rentals that were on these big old school property management companies that were not optimizing technology, they weren't using dynamic pricing, they a lot of them weren't using Airbnb and Verbo where the majority of the traffic was, they would get really mad. And they would, when I had a buyer who was under contract on one of the properties that were being managed by these property management companies, they would like try to not let us in to view it. They would make everything as difficult as possible because, I mean, just my clients alone, you know, kind of took a lot of business off of those local property management companies. But then it ended up, you know, eventually as time went on, it was everybody's clients because people realized, oh, I don't have to give this person 40%. I can do this myself on Airbnb and Verbo. And uh, a lot of the ones that weren't doing a good job, have really you know, kind of been exposed, so to speak. There's still always going to be people who don't want to manage it themselves, who will use a property management company. But a lot of the ones who weren't doing really like business on the up and up have kind of been exposed for that at this point. So um, it's, it's definitely been a change for those guys. And a lot of them for the, I mean, nobody likes change, you know, a lot of big industries don't like change. And, and it was a definite disruption around 2018, 2019. Yeah. I mean, it's like Uber thought that there would, I mean, I thought once Uber came out, there would be no more taxis, but there's still taxis, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when Airbnb came out, you'd think maybe there's not going to be property managers, but they are, they just maybe are taking less. I think 25% is a little more normal. A, yeah. A, about normal now. Yeah. Okay. So I have personally never bought a property for the sole purpose of short-term rental. We have short-term rentals, but mainly for a personal use. Like, hey, we want to be able to visit this area and ski in this area, so we'll buy it, but we'll rent it out to cover our costs. And, and so it's really more for personal use, but to, to really hunt for a, a short-term rental is not something I've done because it scares me. It scares me that I don't know the, the market well enough. I don't know if it will rent. It's just, it's a different business model completely from long-term rental. So how do you find a, a market and a property that would only be used for short-term rental? So for me, I choose only vacation rental markets. So areas that I went growing up as a kid, and I mean, anybody can can do this method of think of somewhere you went growing up with your parents where you stayed in a condo or beach house or cabin rather than a hotel. I don't like, I, I or what I don't do is go into like metro markets where on streets where people live and buy properties that would have been somewhere for someone to buy to live in. Uh, we focus only on markets where the tourism is really extensive and, and high volume and areas where there's not a lot of tourism, sorry, not a lot of tourism, not a lot of hotel presence and also not a lot of primary homeowners. So like I live in the 30A area of Florida. There are only 10,000 of us who live here, but there are 10 million people that come here to visit every summer to go to our beaches. So I focus on areas like this, where there's millions of tourists coming in. There's very good, friendly, short-term rental regulations because the whole economy kind of depends on the tourism of the people that are staying in these short-term rentals. There's not a lot of hotels, so there's no one to really lobby against it. 
And it's been this way for decades. Like Destin, right next door to where I live, my grandmother's been coming down from Mississippi and renting vacation rentals since 1937. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we focus on markets like that. So like Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, regional drivable, very mature vacation markets where pretty much I would say in the types of markets that we focus on, 80% of all of the real estate ever done in these markets has been for the purpose of vacation rentals and second homes. So then how do you, I mean, that totally makes sense. And that's basically what we do too, sort of by accident, yeah. but why, <laughs> um, but how do you know if it's saturated or not? You know, like Destin, if, if, mm -hmm. if people have been owning vacation rentals since the 1930s, and it's mostly vacation rentals, how do you know you're going to stay rented? That's a really good question. And so saturation is a term that's kind of come up the last few years, and it's not something that concerns me. Like you don't hear multifamily investors going, oh, I can't buy an apartment in Austin because it's saturated. There's other apartment buildings there. We can't go there. Well, uh, they, will, they are now because <laughs> it is very well, saturated. <laughs> so, well, well, unless you get the right price, right? Right. So yeah. you can't just, if, if you look at, there's, there's three things you have to do and you have to do all of them right in order to be successful. I like, I want to be in a market that has a lot of rentals. I do not want to trailblaze. I don't want to be the person to fight the battles of, is this going to be allowed in this market or not? Is this, you know, are we fighting hotels? Are we fighting like Nashville has a lot of this push and pull all the time where, you know, nobody, nobody wants Nash Nashville is the bachelorette party capital of the world. Nobody wants you know, in a quiet street where they're trying to raise their family, a bachelorette party house opening up next door and you're trying to raise your kids and there's penis balloons everywhere. Like nobody wants that. <laughs> so I focus We've on a house like that next door here too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pain. Yes. And they're loud. So, <laughs> um, the saturation thing you have to buy, right. You have to finance right and you have to manage right in order to be successful. So the reason that markets get saturated is because there's enough tourism to support X amount of rentals. So they get saturated because there's a lot of people who are successfully doing short-term rentals in that market. So I like that. I would rather fish in a pond of 10 million visitors than of 10,000 visitors. But if you don't pay attention and adapt to changes in the market, you're not going to do well. So like here in 30A, uh, where I live, if you pull up Airbnb, the, you're going to see thousands and thousands of listings. Thousands and thousands of those listings are still going to have wicker furniture, really the big white Florida tiles with the black grout from 2005, because that was kind of the last big building boom. Uh, you're going to see a lot of like pastel colors and just really, really grandma stuff. So <laughs> just because there's a lot of rentals in a market doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of good rentals in a market. And you have to do, like I said, those three, three things right. So if you're buying a grandma condo in a great building, you're going to have to update it and make it cute and attractive. You're going to have to have really great pictures, good amenities. You know, you have to adapt to the times. You can't just buy grandma's condo and slap it up on Airbnb and expect for it to work. So there's lots of data sources uh, to help you figure out how much property should be able to make, how much other properties of the same size in the market that you're buying in are making. Uh, there's AirDNA, there's Rabu, there's Revity, there's all kinds of them. I recommend using as many as possible because they don't all pull the same numbers. They do everything just a little bit differently. And then using what I call the enemy method. So when we started, I'm going to sound like my grandparents, we uphill in the snow both ways. When we started, there were no data companies. You just had to do what we have deemed the enemy method, which is just looking at the other properties in the market, looking at the ones that are popular, that are booked, that are booked at high rates and saying, okay, what about this property? Can my property do better? Or, you know, what can we not compete with? Like, does this property have a mountain view in mind? Doesn't. And really, it, it's really just a competitor audit. You're looking at all the properties around you. What do they have that's making them successful? What can you emulate? What can you improve on? And doing those things. It, it, in the simplest form, it's just looking at what you can do to make a guest choose your property instead of theirs. Because you're never truly competing with the entire market. You're, you know, you shrink it down to your bedroom count and then you shrink it down a little bit further to really just, you know, good listings and not good listings. And it's really more bedroom counts that get saturated than entire markets. So if you're looking in a, a vacation market that like what we focus on doesn't have a lot of hotels, 
one bedrooms almost always make up less than 1% of the available listings. I own several one bedrooms all the way up to five bedrooms. And even in the worst economic times are one bedrooms like stay booked. So it's really can be more of a bedroom count choice once you get into a market that you know has the tourism to support a lot of rentals. It's interesting because there are people who choose a totally different ideology, right? They, they'll go next to hospitals or they'll go into town mm -hmm. um, where there isn't much tourism. It's just, like you said, families, but the the plan is different. It's not for parties. Mm -hmm. It might be because grandmas want to come see their kids and, and be nearby, but not stay with <laughs> with their with their kids and and uh you know, and all the craziness of that mm -hmm. or just, um, you know, work related. I mean, yeah. what do you think of that plan? That can absolutely work. It's just not the way I do it. Like that's the cool thing mm -hmm. about real estate investing is there's a thousand ways to be successful. And you know, the way that I've chosen works great for me. There are plenty of people out there who focus only on like month long corporate rentals or, uh, traveling nurses is a whole thing or, you know, a million different ways to do things that are still successful. So that's the cool thing about real estate investing is very rarely, you know, if you're making money, you're probably not doing it wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and again, like corporate rentals have been around forever. And right. yeah, so it, it's, uh, there's lots of ways you just have to find the one that works for you and, and right. where you're going to get your income source, you know, how right. are you going to market for it? And if it's Airbnb, you know, that might be different than, you know, corporate rental, you might have a connection with a, a big employer or something. Well, I mean, so, I know for me, like if depending on where I'm traveling, will determine whether I get a hotel or a vacation rental. And I've been like crucified in my own Facebook group for this, where I'm like, Hey, I'm going to Houston. I need a hotel where I can fit a sprinter van. And they're like, a hotel, this, you're the short-term rental girl. Uh, <laughs> but if I'm going to a conference or something in a big city where I'm not going to have the kids with me, I want room service. I want to be waited on. I want there to be a salon in there so I can get my hair done before the conference. Like it's a different thing that I'm looking for. But if we're going somewhere with the family, then I do want a vacation rental. So it's, you know, different people, are going to choose different things depending on where they're going. It's not like, a, oh, I'm always going to pick an Airbnb or I'm always going to pick a hotel. They, they serve different purposes. And I think people try to make them compete a lot when it isn't always a competition. It's so true. At a conference, it's just so much easier to have your room right there so you can run up and, <laughs> and uh, have a little quiet time. <laughs> but getting your hair done, wow. Okay, that is, that is probably the big takeaway for me is why have I not tried that? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> because I always like miss a spot uh, with the hair straightener. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to get my hair done for a conference, have that handled, and I don't, let's take one thing off my plate. Love it. Love it. Okay. <laughs> Wish I'd done that in, uh, in Cancun because it was hopeless. My hair was hopeless in that humidity and the rain <laughs> and the hurricane that uh, went right by us. Okay. When you're analyzing the numbers, how does it differ from a long-term rental? What, what, what are you looking at? Well, seasonality for sure. So long-term rentals, the income, the rent is what the rent is for at least a year or whatever your minimum um, <clears throat> lease term is. Whereas short terms, it's more, you have to look at things on an annual basis. So a lot of people analyze long terms, looking at what they, what their monthly income versus expenses are. You can't really do that in short term because of seasonality. So in January, you're not gonna make any money <laughs> in July. You're going to make a ton in most markets, depending on what the seasonality is. And with short term, you can also make tweaks that will show in the income relatively quickly. So you can't go in there and update a unit of a long term rental when somebody is living there. You have to wait at least a year to update or wait for somebody to move out. But with a short term, you can look at your calendar and say, mm, I'm not making as much money. Let me add a hot tub. And then that will show up almost immediately in the income, whether that helps or not. So I like the ability to make tweaks pretty quickly in short term to increase income, but you really do have to look at it as an, from an annual basis and not a monthly basis, because if you're analyzing based on monthly, and I see this in my Facebook group, like every November people in Panama city beach, which is dead in November, they come, they say, Oh my God, I was so busy all year. And now I've got nothing. What, you know, the market's changing. It's saturated. And we're like, it's just the off season, <laughs> but you have to look at it from an annual basis rather than monthly. Otherwise you will get to that off season month and go, holy crap, what happened? So it's really important to look at things annually, understand where your seasonal dips are going to be 
and uh, just adjust accordingly. And don't panic. But, don't panic. Yeah, <laughs> but for real. <laughs> don't panic. But if it's sitting, if you kind of know that, would you just kind of maybe choose to do a short-term long rental? In other words, like a couple of months or something like that? It depends on the market and the size of the property. So like we've got a big four bedroom property in Destin. That's never going to be rented by like a snowbird in the mm -hmm. off season for a few months, but a one bedroom right on the beach, one bedroom condo, snowbirds love those. So you probably could in November, December, January, get a Canadian or somebody coming in from Michigan uh, or somewhere like that, that wants to stay for a few months. You can. Now the thing about that, which there are other types of medium term rentals you can do, but that's going to be the most prevalent like here in this market because there's not a lot of industry other than tourism. So really your only medium term renters are going to be snowbirds. Those guys a lot of times are looking for a really good deal. So it can actually be a, just not worth it to rent mm -hmm. your condo for, you know, 1500, 2000 bucks a month than mm -hmm. just to l leave it open and let it rest, <laughs> so to speak. So yeah. it's possible, but what, Depending on the market, we kind of advise people to just know in the off season in certain markets, there's like nothing you can do. Like they'll say, hey, what can I do to get rentals in the off season? And sometimes there, there's just not anything. And that's OK. You know, you're making enough money in the high season to get through. So, for example, our four bedroom in Destin makes about one hundred seventy five thousand dollars a year gross. And we know we paid six hundred and fifty for it. So I'm fine with those numbers are great. But I just know end of November, December, January, we're not going to be booked. So, and that just is what it is. So you just have to kind of get comfortable with knowing when your seasonality is. And there isn't, there's no way I'm not going to get a 4,000 square foot, four bedroom booked when it's cold at the beach. It's just not happening. So <laughs> a little bit of like having to, to be real with yourself on that too. What's been really interesting. We have a subdivision that we're building in Park City and we went through COVID where everything was shut down. It was really difficult. So the project just came to a standstill. And, uh, but we still had to pay the bank loans, right? So uh, Rich and I decided to buy one of the units to keep the project going and put it on the short-term rental market. But it's Utah, it's Park City, it's seasonal, right? It, winter and pretty much just January to April, right? <laughs> so we had no idea how this was gonna go. But what we discovered is because it's a development and because we bought it sort of early on, all the people buying houses want a place to live, you know? So we've actually had it rented nonstop, but more like for a couple of months at a time mm -hmm. for people who uh, just want to move to the area because their house isn't done quite yet, but they want to want to be there. So what do you think of that plan of like buying early on in a subdivision, a newer home that maybe the future homeowners would would stay at? or the worker, or even the workers of the project. Yeah, you know, again, just depends on the market and what's going on around it. If that is a viable strategy, then then go for it. Uh, I think that, it, especially the way real estate is now in any asset class, being creative is very important to to be able to find new ways to make money. The old ways still work, but we, we have to adapt, right? So I think that finding a strategy like that is really cool. And it's not gonna work everywhere, every time, just like nothing does. But being able to find that new way of doing things is a really important skill set to have. Yeah, I mean, it really just came down to having a relationship with the agent because the agent's trying to sell the property and the people have to get out of their house. It's like they're the ones calling me saying, please tell me it's available. So, you know, <laughs> always networking's everything. Okay, last question is management. I still manage my own Airbnbs only because I don't have very many. But how, how do you manage yours? And how? And like when you're scale, especially when you're scaling. <clears throat> okay. So we have eight short-term rentals. The rest of our portfolio is long-term and, and multifamily. Um, we still technically self-manage. We do have a VA who helps with all of the parts of our business, but part of his job is to help manage the short terms, like help manage the communication, schedule maintenance if something's broken, things like that. Uh, and really it only gets escalated to us if somebody is like really unhappy and that we need to give them a discount or something like that. So uh, we started fully self-managing. And I think when we got to four or five is when we brought in a VA to kind of teach how to do it. And now that's part of his job. But I think a lot of people make the mistake of wanting to try and automate everything and delegate everything too early. They, they buy a house and want to immediately put a VA on it when they've never done it before themselves. So they don't know how to train 
the VA. So I think mm. it's really important to manage. You got to manage at least one year, one full year. So you know what the seasonality looks like. You know what the FAQs are going to be at the different times of year from the guests and what they want. And then maybe work on training a VA to help. That makes that makes sense. Okay, good. And also the tax benefits seem to be better unless I understand it incorrectly, but being actively involved allows me to get more deductions. Yes. Can, um, can you speak to yeah, that? So, yeah, a little bit. Uh, without without uh, breaking CPA rules. <laughs> right. We're not going to break CPA rules. Call Amanda Hahn <laughs> if you have any questions. She's m- one of my favorite uh, CPAs in this space who's really, really good at explaining this. So there's something called the short-term rental loophole that is especially helpful for high-income W-2 earners like doctors, attorneys, et cetera, where you can, if you meet a certain amount of material participation hours, which means if you spent a certain amount of time, which there are three different ways you can do that, I think you have to, you can either meet 500 hours spent on your property or uh, the other one is like 100 hours, but it's also more than anybody else combined. There's a few different ways. Again, Amanda has lots of content on this, so follow her. I'm not a CPA. Uh, but if you're not able to qualify as a real estate professional, which means that you spend more time on real estate than anything else, which if you're a doctor and you try to get real, real estate professional status, they're not going to give it to you because the world knows you're spending more time being a doctor than doing real estate. But You can take advantage of the STR tax loophole by getting the benefits of being a real estate professional without actually having to qualify for real estate professional status by meeting those hours. And short-term rental is the only way that only way you can do that. There's no other asset class that you can use to hit this. So uh, again, follow Amanda, but it really does make a huge difference on taxes. Like every year, the short-term shop around this time, we start getting an onslaught of high income earners who are like, we got to close something by the end of the year so we can get material participation, then get the benefits of doing that cost segregation analysis to offset the taxes on our big doctor job over here. Yeah. Love that. Okay. And also if you do rent, I don't know, a unit on your property or a room on your property occasionally, then you have maybe some write-offs there too, uh, Mm -hmm. things that you need to do to your yard or, you know, to make it nicer for your guests. Yeah. All right. Well, again, talk to the CPAs to know exactly what you can write off. Of course. <laughs> okay. Well, Avery, it's just been great to have you here on the Real Wealth Show, and you've got me a little bit more inspired to try something new. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining me here on the Real Wealth Show. I want to let you know that we have a property tour in San Antonio on November. Third. On November 2nd, we'll also be having a cocktail party in San Antonio, and this is during the Day of the Dead, so it should be a really good time. If you want to find out more about that, just go to realwealthshow.com and click on the Connect tab to see our upcoming tours. I'll be there with Rich and actually the whole Real Wealth team because we're doing our retreat there afterwards, so we'd love to meet you and you'll get to meet all of us. Also, we're just launching our Build to Rent syndication. We are building 26 duplexes in the northwest part of San Antonio, the fastest growing zip code in the country. I should say the top, in the top 10 list of that. So we're excited to take investors there to see that as well. But we'll also be touring finished homes if you're in the process of a 1031 exchange and need replacement property, or you're just looking to build your own portfolio. Come check it out November 3rd in San Antonio. Thanks again for joining us here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.